Alright, now that the 1,000 subscriber celebration is over, it's time to go back to doing what we normally do, which is talking about everything that's happening in the industry these days, and... who oh boy. <laughs> if you take in the week before last into account, a lot have, of things have happened lately that are worth talking about. Uh, some in particular I deliberately tried to avoid speaking at length about, because I feel that there's no point. Uh, take the guy who put that one game on Steam Greenlight as an example, and you know which game I'm talking about, okay? That game's so vile I refuse to even say its proper name. This is a dude who tried to prove how overly sensitive everybody is, big air quotes on that, by releasing the most offensive game that was humanly possible to make. This is a dude who painted a bright red target on everybody's back, including mine, that any politician just needs to take aim at to throw all of us under the bus, and he expects a thank you for it. This is a dude who tried to make the gaming industry better by making it infinitely worse. Do you need me to tell you this guy is an idiot? If there's anything I've learned in this industry, it's that perspective is everything. And the only perspective you can see from 100% of the time is your own. Which is why it's incredibly important that you check what the world looks like from someone else's point of view from time to time, especially if you're in business. This can take many different forms. Listening to customer feedback is a huge part of it, yes, but not sealing yourself in an echo chamber is equally valuable. One of the worst things you can do in any creative medium is lock yourself in an environment where everyone constantly agrees with you just because it's easier and comfier than the alternative. You need to study people who have tread your chosen path before, figure out what they did and why people responded to it so well. You need people who will challenge your ideas and tell you how to do them better rather than someone who will just nod their head in silence every time you speak. This is why Hidden in the Truth and I get along so well. As an artist, I have wildly rampant ambitions for everything I work on. If I can make a game that virtually injected you with ecstasy, I might just do it. But as my producer, he keeps all those ambitions grounded in reality so that A, I don't make a fool of myself by overpromising right out of the gate, and B, my games actually ship sometime this century because God knows that left to my own devices, I'd always want to go back and make it just a little better before people get their hands on it. But he's only one guy, and we're all capable of mistakes, as evidenced these days by the almost constant stream of news stories featuring big companies doing horrendously anti-consumer things. I implore you guys, help keep me in check. Make sure I never fall into some of the most common traps that other developers tend to when the money starts coming in. And as an extension of that, this video will cover three simple things that, if I ever do, I give full legal permission to anyone out there who's seen this to slap me upside the head for. Condition 1. If Team Pizza ever starts releasing yearly sequels, slap me upside the head. I point out this in particular because it's indicative of a much more serious set of other problems that essentially boil down to Team Pizza getting too big for its britches. Games, like any art form, are passion projects and should stay that way. They aren't products that you just buy out of some form of necessity like toilet paper or Cheetos. They're meant to make you feel something, to fill your life with joy, make you feel things in ways the real world couldn't, and maybe even make you see the real world in a new, brighter light by letting you explore the darker aspects of it in a safe environment. You cannot produce something like that every 365 days. There is no flipping way. I cringe at the thought that I might someday get short-sighted enough to think that it's possible. That I might get into a position where my team is so big, so disconnected from each other, and yet so thinly stretched between so many different games all being developed at once that selling 5 million units of any particular one would be considered a failure. My nightmare is the idea that something like Space Shift would have day one DLC with tons more content coming down the line that nobody asked for or probably even really wants because that's the only way I could recoup the cost of making it in the first place. Money is important, I'll admit that. I still want to have enough of it in the bank after a game's launch to make another one, but the instant that becomes the sole deciding factor in why I do anything in this industry, it's time to burn everything to the ground and start again. Condition 2. 
If I'm ever condescending to you guys, slap me upside the head. I worked in retail for 12 months. I can put up with a lot of other people's crap, but the one thing I have absolutely zero tolerance for is being treated like I'm stupid. Gamers especially seem to have built-in nonsense radars. We can see it, we can smell it, and we can feel it coming a mile away. We know when a trailer looks too good to be true. We know when a screenshot has been doctored up to look better than the final game, and we remember when a company insults our intelligence, when they arbitrarily decide that they can tell you what you want to play instead of going to any particular forum on the subject and seeing what's practically plastered on the wall clear as day. As of right now, I'm being very careful not to do any of that, because here's the thing, you don't need me. As Koji Igarashi, Playtonic Games, Concept, and Gears for Breakfast have all proven, if I'm failing to deliver the kinds of experiences that you guys want, there are people who will be more than happy to fill that void, and do it better than I ever could if I had just stayed the course. As an artist, those people are my constant competition, and serve as a very humbling reminder that my customers are far smarter than my accountant would lead me to believe they are. And lastly, condition three. You know what, if I ever start doing any of the crap Konami has been pulling lately, don't just slap me inside the head, whack me in the back with the blunt side of a freaking shovel. If there is a way to piss off this community, Konami has done it this past month. They cancelled a highly anticipated game with high profile talent working on it. In fact, they fired part of that talent, one of their most beloved and famous team members I might add, for what we're being led to believe are petty personal reasons. They unceremoniously pulled PT from the PS4 storefront, got rid of the website, and then started shutting down auctions on eBay for people selling PS4s with the game still installed in an effort to erase all traces of it from existence. Of course, they voluntarily removed themselves from the US stock market before doing any of this, an act we're being told was a quote, cost-saving measure, and when Super Bunny Hop used his journalistic contacts to expose them for the failures they were, they they issued the guy a copyright takedown in a desperate attempt to keep the real reasons behind all this hoopla secret. This is not a company acting in goodwill towards their consumers. This is a bunch of executives throwing a temper tantrum and letting their personal feelings get in the way of the enjoyment of literally millions of people. Not that they care, considering they also recently announced that Konami will be putting a primary focus on the mobile market from here on out. And isn't that just a perfect capstone to this whole affair? It's as if they're saying, oh yeah? Oh yeah? Well we didn't want to be a part of this market anyway! F*** that guy and f*** all of you! Bye! The real travesty here is that Konami doing all of this means it's the end of an era. The end of franchises. Bloodstain will probably be a better Metroidvania game than anything the company will put out under the official name from this point forward, but never again will we hear the tales of the Belmonts. Never again will we see the likes of Metal Gear Solid 5 or any of the games that came before, at least not in the same format with the same characters we know and love. It brings back memories of current day Rareware, and you bet your ass companies like Konami and Rare will never let go of those names to anyone else just to make their fans happy. Because that's what an irresponsible company does. It sits on its pile of dead IPs like a junkyard dog, biting the legs off anybody who even tries to get close. And like a stupid mutt, they're not planning on doing anything with all this junk. They probably wouldn't even know how if you asked them because they're businesses first and artists second. We don't do that at Team Pizza. You know who owns the rights to Righteous? Hidden in the Truth. You know who owns the rights to Misa Blues? Drawman. And you know who's gonna own the rights to Space Shift? Me, because it's my idea. And if the powers that be make this company a place that I don't want to be a part of anymore for whatever reason, I'd like to continue my work in a way that's beneficial to everyone involved, not just those with the fattest wallets. My only hope is that it always stays that way. Because if it doesn't, well, you know what to do. Also, coming from the perspective of somebody who's working in the field right now, I'd just like to add a fourth condition to that list and post here in my rant. If I ever screw with anybody on YouTube, yeah, same rules apply. Just whap, sure do you can. All right, I guess Falcon Punch would be better in that situation. And make sure it's a gentle whack, too, upside the head. I'd rather prefer to live to learn my lesson from all this. That That is the purpose of this exercise in the first place. Don't just, like, donkey punch me or something.
Donkey Kong Punch? Is that a thing that happened? I guess he winds up in Smash Brothers. I'm good at outros.